Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Equay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Today, my very special guest is fellow Paul is Dead researcher Steve Farber. Steve has been looking into where biological Paul might be buried, and his research has presented a very interesting theory. And without further ado, here's Steve. Well, folks, I have the show today that uh, I have been promising for quite a while, and Steve Farber is with us. Steve is a Paul is Dead researcher, and he has spent a lot of time looking into the McCartney and Beatles conspiracy. And today's show is going to be about where biological Paul McCartney, where he may be buried. And uh, Steve, welcome to the show. But before we get started, I was wondering if you could just fill the audience in on your journey in the whole Paul is Dead McCartney conspiracy arena. How did you get there? When did you start looking at it? Why is it of interest to you? Hi, Mike. I started watching YouTube videos primarily on Paul is Dead. Things just kept popping up on the uh, YouTube about it, and I watched a bunch of things. I finally came to your site, you know, that you had going, and I found yours to be the most definitive. And, uh, and the more I got into it, I, I saw you mentioning about uh, memoirs of Billy Shears, and I read the book, it's 666 pages, which is also a bit creepy. And no, there I thought. But I couldn't put the book down. It was uh, so informative, and you could tell that, you know, it was written by Thomas U. Harriet, but you could tell it's Billy Shepard or whatever his real name is, you know, was actually co-writing that, I believe. And I found it fascinating because I grew up with the Beatles. I don't know if I was six years old. I think I was six years old when they came on the Ed Sullivan Show, and I was always fascinated with the Beatles. They were an instant sensation. And I grew up with them. Every time an album came out, I'd go buy an album, even display it in pictures. I remember Sergeant Pepper, I had it opened up in front of my fireplace, and my family took a picture of me. You know, just very into the Beatles growing up. I still like them a lot. I was the same way, you know, and I've mentioned this on a lot of shows. I was a huge Beatle freak, huge. And, uh, at, you know, at the age of nine, I was begging my father to take me to go see Yellow Submarine. And I, and I know we'll talk about Yellow Submarine later on in the presentation. You know, so they were a big, big influence in my life. Now, when you were reading memoirs, did you have a reaction? Did you feel yourself getting angry, upset, or was it okay? Yeah, at, fir at first I was uh, very angry at Billy, you know, and then I, I started thinking it's much deeper than him, you know. It's much deep. He was being posed almost as a puppet, I believe. And I started having more compassion for Billy the more I read it. I had to realize myself that, Bill was actually probably my favorite Beatle, and it wasn't really Paul McCartney. You know, I love songs like Yesterday. If Paul actually wrote it, I don't know. But, you know, I love some of the old Beatles songs, but when Billy came out, music just completely changed. And I liked his music just as much, if not better. So started having a little bit of compassion for him and started thinking, like, how do you live your life like this? Yeah, that's an interesting point you make because um, I've posed that to folks who – will write me and say, oh, I, I can't stand Billy's music and all of this. And, and I said, well, before you found out about the whole Paul is dead McCartney conspiracy, did you hate the music from 1967 to 1970? Did you not like Sgt. Pepper? Did you not like Magical Mystery Tour? Did you not like the White Album? Did you not like Abbey Road or Let It Be? What I have found is the vast majority of the folks, before they figured out or before they got themselves familiar with the Paul is Dead conspiracy, they loved his music, along with the biological Paul period from 1962 to 1966. You know, before people figured out the Paul is Dead conspiracy or the McCartney conspiracy, they were on board with the entire catalog of songs, whether it was the bio Paul period or whether it was the Billy period. And then once they had that suspicion that, hey, wait a minute here, Billy is not biological Paul, then all of a sudden, they don't like his music anymore. It's kind of an interesting dynamic, I guess, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I feel exactly the same way. And uh, like I said, many times I, I like Bill's music better. I think he was more creative as far as, you know, all the instruments he played. Because I just don't believe biological Paul played more than the bass, maybe played guitar. You know, you just don't see that. You know, once in a while you see a picture of him at a drum set, but I don't ever remember seeing him actually playing the drums in video or anything, so... You know, definitely when the McCartney album came out, the solo one, when it, with him playing all the instruments, that was incredible to me. Blew me away. The guy's talented, no doubt, you know. 
No, he is talented, and uh, that's one of the things that I brought up about the biological pole period. We will see pictures of him behind a drum set or at the piano. These are staged photos. These are photo ops. These are uh, photos and images that are taken to, to distribute and disseminate out for public consumption to give the impression that he's a multi-instrumentalist, but uh, he was a, a bass player and a guitar player. That's essentially it. And uh, Billy is much more than that as far as his ability to, to be a multi-instrumentalist. So in any case, uh, what I want to do, because I'm, I think I might be derailing us here from the, the nuts and bolts of what you really want to talk about. Now, let's talk a little bit about your 9-11 awareness. As you know, and, and I've spoken about many times, 9-11, whether it be a date or 9-11, whether it's encoded in an event, the numbers 9 and 11 from a numerology perspective is what I'm saying. It is an important date, and that date and those numbers are all around the Beatles. So tell us a little bit about your awareness of 9-11 and what your thoughts are. I ended up seeing 9-11 on my clocks all the time. It kind of spooked me out. It was after reading memoirs. You know, it wasn't before that, really. But I started seeing it all the time. I'd look up, and it just happened to be that time, of either the nighttime or the morning. And I'd see that on a clock, you know, or on my cell phone. And I was thinking, you know, is somebody trying to tell me something, you know? So it felt like that. And, uh, you know, at first I thought it was a warning about we're going to have another 9-11 terrorist attack. That's what I started to think. I didn't really connect it to the Paul was dead thing. And then you find out that's the day he was supposedly, you know, in a car crash or murdered or whatever it was. Ends up being the same day. So part of me thought, it felt almost like, Sounds real strange, but I felt like Paul's reaching out for me from the grave to get his word out to tell that's, you know, certain things about what happened. And I'm sure that's not true, but it's kind of the gut feeling I had, you know, and I don't want to act like a weirdo, but that's just how I felt. So, you know, 9-11 seems like an important date. Like you said, it's in numerology a lot around the Beatles. And uh, that in a nutshell is what I felt. Okay. So a lot of people who have looked into, um, into the, the conspiracy who have read memoirs have come back to me and said, Steve, that they had very similar feelings, that they felt a motivation and a drive to move forward and to do further research. Many times other folks have reached out. These are other researchers, by the way, people that you and I both know that um, really couldn't explain why that motivation was there, but they kept pushing and pushing. That's happened to me. I'm going to be very honest. Uh, when I did the first show back in September of 2016 with Sophia Smallstorm, I fully expected that was going to be my first and last show on the topic. It's now four years later, and um, I'm still talking about it. And I'm still looking into it, and I'm still finding things. I've had some researchers come back to me and um, and say that since reading the book, they had dreams where Billy showed up in their dreams. And I, I had that myself, to be honest. I, I had, uh, I think it was four dreams where he was in them. Very lucid dreams. They were very clear. They were like visits, if you will. There was nothing weird or abstract about them. I was in these dreams and I was actually having a conversation with him and talking with him and stuff like that. So again, like, I don't want to sound weird either. <laughs> but have you had anything like the dream or is it just the drive and the motivation to push forward with the research? Um, I, I've had nothing in the dreams at all, but, you know, the scarier part is that it's in reality to me. And, and the more that 9-11 came up, the more I wanted to research, just like you said. I, I felt like it's like a good mystery novel. You just can't put it down. And I'm still to this day, I run a PID site. You know, I, I can't seem to put it down or put down images of him. I see him on Pinterest everywhere. And I, you know, there's just so much going on that it's only the tip of the iceberg. I still feel like. It's, you know, it's just like some a book I can't put down. Yeah. But then the, on the downside of that, my wife doesn't believe me. You know, my friends don't believe me. So you're, you're in a small community of people that believe it. And then there's people that just won't accept it. So, but it definitely felt like a spirit reaching out to me. And I do believe in the spirit world. You know, I definitely do. I believe after we die, you know, part of you goes on. And... You know, whether it was him trying to contact me or just some weird fluke, it just felt like that. You know? And still to this day, it does. 
Yeah, and the conspiracy for me is much more than the death and replacement of biological Paul McCartney. There are so many facets around it that were in play. The whole social engineering piece of it, Tavistock, the occult, the rituals, and all of that. I tell folks that um, the whole Paul dying bit, for me, has become a subplot. Uh, not that I don't care that biological Paul McCartney passed away. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that the conspiracy for me just didn't stop there. Okay, so once you know and you understand that he was replaced, then there's this other piece of it which is very far-reaching as far as understanding how our reality actually works. Because you can actually take this conspiracy and all of the elements and all of the variables that went into it and are still going into it, and you can apply that to many other things that are going on in the world, other types of psychological operations and so on. It's, it's a very, very deep conspiracy, and it's very, very wide. And that's why, you know, researchers who just focus on that small piece of it, which is, I want to prove that biological Paul died and he was replaced, that's that's good. It's obviously, we have to show that and we have to prove that. But my feeling is, and the way I have approached this, it goes beyond that. It goes way beyond that. In any case, I don't want to pontificate here too much. Now, what we want to do, Steve, I think is um, on the next slide, you're going to talk to us about the Standing Stones. And if you could just take us through that, because I'm sure a lot of folks who are listening to the show won't have any idea what this is. Yeah, uh, Standing Stones, they're called uh, Menhirs, if I'm pronouncing that right. But what, I, what I read from pagan times, they were used as ancient burial grounds or an actual sacrificial site. And then there's other things, too. I just focused on those because that seemed pertinent to what we're talking about. But they're very ancient, and the fact that one's on Billy's farm in the middle of a sheep field seems pretty odd to me, you know, especially because Paul had purchased that farm. Biological Paul purchased that farm before he died. And I don't know if Paul put that there or if it was already there. You know, I, I don't know how that got there. It would be interesting if I could find out, find out more about how it got there, if it was just on the land already. But, you know, I believe it could be a burial, burial chamber there. You know, or, or a sacrifice happened there. But I'm going by conjecture. No, but it's very interesting because, um, as you mentioned, and we'll get to a slide that talks a little bit more about the farm, but biological Paul, he did purchase the farm, and then Billy inherited it uh, when he took the role of Paul McCartney. So it, it is interesting that the farm was purchased by biological Paul. They've got this standing stone on the property on a hill, right? Yes, up up in like a sheep pasture, right behind the barns on High Park Farm near Campbellton. Yeah, so it's it's very very odd. And um, if the property were purchased by Billy after Paul died, that would make it, I think, less. Uh, I don't want to say less interesting, but maybe less of a connection. But the fact that the property actually bridges across the two of them, to me, makes it very interesting. And this is why when you were presenting this topic and talking about it on the uh, on the page that I used to run, the, the memoirs page, that I found this extremely intriguing. With memoirs out and stuff, it doesn't mention that stone, but it's in so many pictures, though, you know, of High Park Farm. And when I started looking into this, that popped up quite a bit in pictures. And then I'm sure in another slide you're going to get to, there's something else about an album, too. You know, it's just very interesting stone. Like you said, it's almost like a grave marker, you know. Instead of like a regular tombstone, it's just a gigantic, you know, erect type of stone. And they're all over Scotland, but I found it odd, just one up there in the middle of the field. So it, it was just bizarre. Yeah, in the middle of his field. <laughs> right. The other odd thing is with that farm, maybe you're getting that on another slide, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but I found it odd that he kept that farm and he didn't keep any of his other properties in Scotland. He sold off quite a bit of them. You know, even when he disappeared, when reporters came up there, that was the farm he was on. He seemed very agitated. People came up there to see him, you know. So he's protecting something, I felt like, you know. Okay, so we mentioned, uh, Steve, an album. And this is very interesting, too. So Billy puts an album out called Paul McCartney's 
standing stone. Yeah. So what do you want to say about that? Well, it's odd. It shows the same stone that's in that field on the front cover of it. You know, it's very prominent. To me, that that whole orchestrational album, it, it's a, it is a pretty good masterpiece. I gotta admit, I, I listen to it once in a while and I enjoy it. And uh, you know, it's very different for Bill to do something like that. I, I almost felt like having that stone on the front. It was almost like a tribute to Paul. I felt like you know, it was uh, you know, something beautiful, beautiful type of music for him. You know, like he almost wrote the music for him. I could be dead wrong, no pun intended, but it just seemed like that to me was something he worked very hard on with other people too. And it seemed to represent that he was with the standing stone on the cover. I just felt like it, a tribute to Paul. You know, that's what I felt. Yeah. And this album speaks volumes about Billy's uh, musical talents and his ability to uh, score music. So let me just, folks, from the slide here, and this will be included in the uh, in the show. Standing Stone is Paul McCartney's second full-length release of original classical music, coming after 1991's Liverpool Oratorio, and was issued shortly after the release of Flaming Pie. The world premiere performance was held at the Royal Albert Hall on October 14, 1997. The Standing Stone Project was composed out of a long poem McCartney authored to describe the way Celtic men might have wondered about the origins of life and the mystery of existence. And Billy used a personal computer and software to help compose, and it was recorded by the 80-piece London Symphony Orchestra, a 120-member choir, and conducted by Lawrence Foster at EMI's Abbey Road Studios. So... Again, Steve, like you said, it, it does appear that there is some kind of reverence to Paul with this album. I would agree with you on that. And then aside from that, is the work that Billy did as far as putting it together, writing the music, scoring it, working with the London Symphony Orchestra, does give us a taste for his abilities. Would you agree? Oh, definitely. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you if that date um, at the Royal Albert Hall on 14th of October... 1997. Is there any numerology to that, or did you not? Maybe you didn't check that out. I just wonder if there was. A... Well, 14 October uh, is one plus four plus one plus zero, which is six. Got it. There's always something with with the dates. Uh, always, always with Billy. So let's go to um, the next slide, Steve. And uh, the the slide is titled "Paul McCartney Purchases High Park Farm in." Kintyre, Scotland. Of course, Billy wrote the song Mole of Kintyre, which is kind of an odd song for a uh, an Englishman to write. Yep. Again, here, let's talk a little bit about this because uh, we've already mentioned this, but we'll get into some more detail. But the farm was uh, purchased on June 17th, 1966, prior to the death of Biological Paul on September 11th, 1966. So, uh, yeah, just tell us a little bit about what's going on here. Yeah, that's correct. Um I guess Paul, from what I read, was advised to do it for tax reasons, tax write-off. found it kind of odd, and I read that Jane Asher was pushing for him to do that, too. Other than that, I don't have a, a lot more details on it, but I believe Biological Paul was only there, like, one time. From what I've read and seen pictures of it, I think there's a picture of him in a football shirt, which I don't have on me, but um, I think it shows him and Jane Asher on that farm. Well, again, from uh, I think this is from the Beatles Bible, if I'm not mistaken. That's the source. I'll put the link down below. But uh, the three-bedroom farmhouse had an asking price of 35,000 pounds and came with 183 acres of land. That's a lot of land. Yes. Yeah. And it was previously owned by a local farmer, Mr. Brown, and his wife. You know, the point here is the fact that this farm – crosses over both biological Paul and Billy. And uh, it is strange that we have this uh, standing stone right smack in the middle of the farm. There's also a triangular, almost like pyramid-shaped garden, it looks like, in front of the standing stone. I think you have it in that slide. And, you know, that when you think Illuminati or whatever, it shows that pyramid. And, you know, I don't know if that has any meaning to it. I just thought I'd point it out. You know, I thought that was interesting because I don't see many. I'm actually in the horticultural field, and you don't see many triangular gardens planted. You know, it's just usually not the case. So, I thought that was kind of interesting too. Yeah, well, I wouldn't discount anything 
uh, with Billy. <laughs> yes, so now here's an interesting uh, tidbit here. So Billy does a song with Elvis Costello, and it's called Shallow Grave. Yeah, that's correct. And that, you know, I was blown away as I started to see all this stuff. You know, I just kept hunting and Googling different names of things, and that pops up, you know. And, you know, it was fitting with what I was working on. And, and the words to the song are just incredible. You know, I don't know if you want to read it there, if you've got the time to do that, but it's, it's incredible words in it even. You know, it even mentions about the Fabulous Five, which I don't know if that means all the four Beatles plus, you know, Paul McCartney. Biological Paul, I mean, Billy, I meant to say, or George Martin, but it, it mentions that even in the song towards the end. Pretty interesting stuff, you know, and just the name of it is different. Yeah, I can read the lyrics. And also, I believe a version of this song is also on the re-release or the extended version of Billy's album, Flowers in the Dirt. And that's another interesting album title, Steve. Sure is. All right. Okay. All right. So here are the lyrics to, um, to Shallow Grave. When I fall in endless sleep, I hope that I'll be buried deep. Let me be the one that fortune favors. Even good children got shallow graves. Throw another clown to the lions. Throw another Joan on the blaze. Cast me away on the cruel calm ocean and leave me for days and days and days and days and days. I won't lie in this poor shallow grave. I won't lie, I won't lie in this poor shallow grave. Dig me down deep where the dead men sleep. I won't lie in this poor shallow grave. Bless the poor, cause like the rich, they all end up in a ditch. In this world of fools and knaves, even good children got shallow graves. The tinker, the tailor, the fabulous five, nobody gets out of this alive. Dig me down deep where the dead men sleep. I won't lie in this poor shallow grave. Dig me down deep where the dead men sleep, I won't lie in this poor shallow grave. And then it goes again. Dig me down deep, dig me down deep, dig me down deep. I won't lie in this poor shallow grave. So that's very, very interesting, especially the line, the tinker, the tailor, the fabulous five, nobody gets out of this alive. So who are the fab five? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what reference that was to, if it's Bill in there, you know, or if it's, you know, like I said, George Martin, I don't know. But, you know, they, they always called themselves the Fab Four, you know? Right. Just have that put in a song, the Fab Five, I thought that was kind of interesting, too. It's a very good song, too. I, I happen to like blues music, and I, I really liked it. I had never heard that song. And then I, when I found it, it was pretty amazing. I thought it was good. You know, I like both artists. I like Elvis Costello and, and him, so. Yeah, and what's interesting, Steve, is... Uh... When I explain to folks about how to understand this conspiracy, the McCartney conspiracy, the Beatles conspiracy, the clues are not found in one place. That's the thing. And they're spread out all over the place. And the clues will be in books. The clues will be in videos. The clues will be in the music. They will be on the album covers. They will be in interviews. And you have to listen very closely. That's how you start pulling the pieces in. A big mistake some people make is that they believe that there is going to be one source which is going to spell it all out for them. And that's just simply not the case. How did you even get a semblance of looking at this standing stone? I mean, what, what triggered the thought for you to say, you know what, I need to look at this closer? Because most people would just see the standing stone there and they wouldn't think twice about it. They wouldn't even know what it was or even care. So what triggered the thought for you? Um, there, there again, it felt like, uh, it felt like a grave mark to me. I, I just thought it was very odd that there's a stone in the middle of a farm, because usually farmers take stones and they'll put them off to the borders of their property. You know, they won't leave it in a field, you know, especially a field with sheep. Like, I, I just couldn't figure out why that would be so prominent there. You know, I would almost think people would want to move it. But it had, either has historical value or he's actually buried up there, biological fault. I tend to believe he is. It's just my gut feeling. There's no way I can prove it unless you you brought somebody up there and dug up that whole area with an excavator, you know, and I don't think that'll ever happen. It, it just felt like that to me, like it was some marker point, you know, other than what a manure stands for. It just seemed odd. I would have felt like there would have been more up there or it just seemed in a like dead center position there. But what made you look at Billy's farm 
What brought you there? Because that's interesting, and most people wouldn't even bother looking at where the guy lives. Well, I, yeah, I thought High Park Farm was kind of interesting. It's over in an area of, what is it called, Campbellton, I believe, which a lot of he lives, and without spoiling an, another person's presentation, I can't go into too much detail. But somebody's worked very hard at his lineage, and I don't want to say his name. You know, I, I thought that was really interesting. That's in Campbellton area where Scottish royalty is. You know, it's very odd because there's a big castle near the ocean there. And, you know, for some reason, I just saw, I just connected the name Campbell, too. Like, if they say William Campbell, you know, Campbellton. It's part of that name almost, and it's spelled the same way. So I almost started connecting things like that. It, it almost became all spiritual. I just felt connections to it. And I still do. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's more to find. In fact, before we started this, you know, I just found something else, you know. So it just keeps happening. I'm sure I'll find more after this is done. Yeah, before the show started, folks, uh, Steve and I were just chatting a little bit. And we were saying that, you know, whenever you think you've reached the end of the road with this thing or you're close to the end of the road, near the goal line, something else pops up. And, you know, if, you, if you're intrepid and this stuff interests you, then you're like, okay, well, let me – Take a look at this. And that takes you down another road. And that's what I was saying before. There is no one-stop shop to figure this thing out, this particular conspiracy or any conspiracy for that matter. It's uh, the analogy I've used in the past, Steve. It's like a million-piece puzzle and there's a hurricane outside and you throw the puzzle pieces out into the wind. So it's as if the pieces are just strewn all over the place and then you know, you've got to go find them. And pick them up and then, you know, start putting the, the pieces of the puzzle back together again. So, uh, again, like I know I said this before to you, you looking at this is, uh, is an excellent piece of, of research. Because I don't know of anybody else who's talked about this. Really, I don't. I don't know of anybody else who's looked at this. And, um, yes, and we do have a mutual friend, folks, who is looking at Billy's, uh, ancestry. And I'm hoping that I can get this person on the show, uh, the work that they are doing is extremely involved. It takes a lot of time to pull it together. So, Steve, maybe our mutual friend uh, will be able to make an appearance and uh, take us through Billy's ancestry. Yeah, I'm sure he will. And uh, you ask about the farm also. And he was the one, which I can't, I don't want to mention his name. I don't think he wants to mention it. You know? Yeah. But um, he, he tipped me off. He, he sent me a video of where I got, you know, another slide coming up about that farm. And it shows like a whole music video, which I'm sure you'll be able to maybe play it on there. I don't know if you can or not, or maybe just the excerpt, you know. Yeah. You know, he tipped me off on that, and he saw when I was seeing about the Standing Stone. And it, it actually shows a split second of the Standing Stone in there, and then some other odd stuff I know you're going to get to in an upcoming slide. You know, he helped me on that, too, so I, I want to give him credit there. Very perceptive. Yes, and, and this particular researcher, folks, is very, very familiar with Scottish tradition. Yep. Okay, so I'll just leave it there. All right, Steve, so now the next slide is Billy and his family planting bulbs on the hill. And what I will do is I will play that video. I'll insert it into the uh, into the show so people can, can watch it. Unfortunately, it's a home video, I guess, that Billy shot with Linda – so the quality isn't uh, high definition, but I'll put it in any way. Uh, it's, it's at a quality level where you will be able to make out what's going on. It's just not going to be high def. So what's, what's going on here with the, the bulbs on the hill, Steve? Like I said, I'm in the horticultural field. I'm a salesman for different nurseries that grow things, tree places out of Oregon, all over the place. So that really intrigued me because at first I couldn't even tell what they were doing. And the more I looked at it, it looked like flower bulbs to me. And it particularly looked like tulip bulbs. I, I can't tell a tulip bulb from a daffodil bulb, though. You know, it's not close enough up to tell anything. Yeah. But to me, I feel like they were planting tulips there. And as you'll probably show in another couple of slides, there's, there's a, a spade in there, like a, which in landscaping, you use that to cut a bed, you know, to make a shape of a bed or along some place you're going to mulch. So, you know, that really intrigued me, too. You know, I was wondering why him and his family are up in the middle of a field planting a rectangular flower bed, you know, and it was the shape of a grave to me. You know, it was six feet long or so. It looked like by three feet wide. 
I mean, why would you plant a garden with just tulip flowers in that sort of shape on a hill in a farm? And you could tell it's out on his farm. It could be somewhere else, but, you know, I feel like it's on that farm, and I feel like it's up on a hill by the views, you say. I wish that the standing stone was shown in those photographs or the film, but it's not. But they do show it earlier. They show the standing stone earlier in that video. Okay, so I'll play that clip. And it is interesting that they're, when I say they, Billy and Linda, are spending so much time dedicating themselves to to doing this planting or whatever it is that they're doing. So obviously, this is of importance. And uh, when I watched the video, Stephen, correct me if I'm wrong, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot else going on around where they're working. So in other words, it's not like they're in a flower bed. No, absolutely not. It's... Uh... It's up on a hill. The only thing, you know, my, both my parents passed away, and, you know, I planted things at their grave, not in that sort of shape, you know. might just be a few flowers here and there. I thought that they were planting. It shows his children there, too. Yeah. As kind of a remembrance of Paul, you know, to, you know, it's almost kind of a loving type of memory. They're planting something to dedicate something to him. That's what I connected in my mind. Whether I'm right, it's just conjecture. That's what I feel like they're doing there. They're doing a memorial to him. And it's something that comes up every year. It's like a rebirth with tulips. They come up, they die, and then they come up again. And it's, you know, it's a rebirth every year. And to have it in that shape, I actually wanted somebody I know who lives over there. But then this COVID thing happened. I wanted that person to go to the farm. They live very close to there. And do some kind of drone footage to see if tulips were up around the time of the year they bloom. And unfortunately, we couldn't get that because of COVID, unfortunately. So, yeah. Yeah. But that would have been a smoking gun to me to have a rectangular field because bulbs just keep coming up for eternity. They're not going to die. They just keep coming up. Very interesting. And on the next slide, we have a little collage here. This is something I think you posted up on Facebook. What I did, Steve, was I actually took the uh, the post and I copy and pasted um, your words here. And you said, if you were following my earlier posts about me thinking Paul McCartney's body is buried on a hill, possibly close to the tall standing stone at his high hill farm in Scotland, here is more evidence. It was pointed out to me by another member that there was footage of this in a 1970 video of Billy and his family planting what appears to, to me as tulip or daffodil flower bulbs the really odd thing is the human-sized grave-looking planting area. These are stills from the video. I feel Paul is buried on that hill. The same informer is going to check out the hill to see if bulbs are pushing up this spring. Hopefully, he's successful finding it. And then, as you just said, because of the whole COVID thing, and I guess, uh, you know, we weren't able to get that footage. But I will put the video in. I will play the video so everybody can see it. But it is very, very strange. Yeah, it happens pretty fast, too, that whole bulb parting thing. And it shows Billy stomping on the ground after they're rolling the turf back. You know, that's the part you got to really watch out for. I don't have the exact minutes when that came up. Yeah. But, see it. you know, he's up on the hill stomping on it after they plant the bulbs. It's a whole bag of bulbs. So it's one of those burlap bags full of tulip bulbs, basically. You know, it could be other types of bulbs. I don't know. But I'm, I'm speculating it's tulips. And you'll probably see in the upcoming slides why I think that. And you talked about that shovel. And on the slide that we're on right now, the top left picture on the right-hand side, we see Linda, and there's that shovel. It's in the ground. Yep, square shovel, spade. They call it a spade, actually. Spade? Okay. Yeah. Do we want to go to the next picture, uh, to Lennon's drawing, where he has that spade in his picture? Yeah, I think so. I think it's a good time to do that. Okay, let's do that. And I know, folks, that... This is a little difficult to see. I'll try to find, if I can, a, uh, a higher definition image. But, uh, Steve, why don't you explain here what you think is going on? Yeah, I actually think that John Lennon, you know, he did kind of cartoon-type drawings. And it shows that spade, the same type of square shovel. It's not, it's not a pointed shovel, as if they buried somebody. But it shows, you know, Martha the dog, the cheap dog, is in the other video. You'll see that pretty clearly. It shows a dog in this video, even though it's very crude drawn. It's either a dog or a sheep. Yeah. It looks like a dog to me. And it shows Bill, I believe, or, or biological Paul. It shows him in his muck boots there, too. Yeah. Like the clothes he was wearing when he was on the farm there quite a bit. He showed himself as kind of a ruffian sort of farm type guy. 
And I think at the bottom, I remember something spelled out there. I believe I told you about what it was. My eyes are going a little bit, so I can't read what it says right now. But something is spelled out at the bottom. I believe it says buried, buried at the bottom, which is another kind of weird clue, you know? Yeah, I had a hard time making that out, so it is difficult to make out. Pretty sure if it's enlarged, you'll see buried. It starts far left of the shovel. Okay. And it goes across. It gets a little, you know, like you said, the quality of this drawing is not great. And then some other oddities on that. It shows what I believe is Paul's head after his accident. And I think you know another photo that's been circulating and that I don't think we want to put up there, you know, because it's pretty graphic. Yeah. But there, there's another photo that basically almost looks like showing Paul's head blown off, to me it looked like, in the photo, if it's him, actually. And this fo this drawing is very close to that. It, it goes down almost like triangular towards his eyes and nose, which is what's in that photograph that was circulating around. I won't put it on my site because it's too graphic, you know. You know, some people want to see that photo. I don't know if it's real. I have no clue. But then to me, it looks like blood's dripping down, you know, towards his eyes. If you really analyze that, that drawing. Yeah. And there's like a point coming out of the top. I don't know if that's blood flow after the accident. Kind of looks like that to me. If you were doing a forensic analysis of a drawing, that's, that's what I would say about it. Yeah. And the photo you mentioned, uh, Steve, uh, it's, it's a rough photo, folks. I, I do have a, a copy of it. And uh, Steve and I have talked about this before, and uh, myself and a couple of other researchers who, you know, we, we are networked together. We've all seen the photo, and we all agree that it's very, very difficult to look at. It's gruesome. And the problem with showing it, other than the fact that it's, it is gruesome, is the fact that uh, we don't know for sure if it is biological Paul. Some folks have looked at it. What they did do was they took a look at the uh, the chin, neck, and shoulder area of the, the photo that is a rough one to look at, and they compared it to the chin, neck, and shoulder area of, uh, of biological Paul. And I have seen this comparison, and I will say that the matchup is pretty close. But, you know, even though uh, we can maybe say that there's a possibility that it is biological, Paul. I'm like you, Steve. I don't feel comfortable putting it up. Yeah, yeah. You know, people have begged me to even send it to them, and I won't. I still keep it on file, just in case whoever could put something like that up. You know, I believe if it's put on Facebook, it will be taken down anyway because of its graphic nature. I, I believe yeah. it would be. But this drawing is almost spot on to what I saw in that photograph, though, too. It has that frayed top of the head. I personally, not going off on a tangent, but I think Paul was chased in his car. I feel like it's like Princess Diana style. I believe she was taken out, too. Just my own conspiracy feeling on it. She was chased because she knew too much about all that's going on in the palace over there. I believe, you know, Paul was chased. I believe maybe he wasn't completely dead when they found him, and then they blew his head off. That's my gut feeling. I don't know for a fact, but I'm just conjecturing. You know, the people that wanted him out, he was out. They made sure of it. You know, that's from, at least from that 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 photograph that I saw, and then seeing John Lennon's picture. I I got shivers when I saw this drawing. Yeah, kind of freaky. So, you know. Yeah, it's it's it is a very weird drawing. And just to tag on to your comment about McCartney's accident in a show I did or a presentation I did about two years ago. It's the Beatles, Paul McCartney, and the Grand Illusion. I talk about how the uh, the accident may have went down based upon somebody who contacted me. And they had said that uh, the accident was set up to happen. And uh, the people behind it were intelligence, British MI6 and the CIA. I did present that in, in my uh, presentation as uh, I presented in a way where I said that a source had come forth and they had explained to me how it went down. So in other words, what I'm saying is that the accident was planned, it was premeditated, but then it was covered up to look like uh, an auto accident. But the accident did include his car, but he was uh, forced off the road and uh, the collision was, was staged to happen. And uh, this person went on to say that the people that were responsible for ensuring that it went down properly also had to make sure that after the accident occurred, that he was indeed dead. Okay, so you, folks, you can read into that. 
uh, any way you'd like, but uh, that's what I was told. So, uh, and again, that's a scenario. That's that's how I'll I'll put it. That's a scenario. Do I know for sure that that's how it went down? No, nobody knows because we weren't there. But this is what was told to me. Uh, this is the same person, by the way, that uh, came to me and uh, explained the uh, the whole street Paul aspect of this, Steve, which panned out. And by the way, another person contacted me. Can't say who this person is, and I won't let the name out yet as far as who Street Paul is. Let's just say that uh, during the Melody Maker Awards on September 13th, 1966, in memoirs, we're told that they pulled out their very, very best double. And this person was an exceptionally good double of Paul McCartney. There are differences. And I also displayed these differences. Uh, I believe it was in my Beatles, Paul McCartney, and uh, the Grand Illusion presentation where I showed the person that was at the Melody Maker Awards playing Paul McCartney, and I took his face, and I put it right next to uh, an image or a photo of biological Paul, a real photo of biological Paul. The similarities were amazing. But you could also see that there were differences in, in the facial structure. But I mean, if you didn't examine them side by side, you would just assume that that was Paul McCartney. And so I had a person reach out to me going back, I guess, around uh, two weeks ago or so. And the person at the Melody Maker Awards was not Paul McCartney. And I need to talk with this person a little bit more to see if they're comfortable with me releasing the name that they gave me of the person that was playing the part at the awards. So that's late breaking news, by the way, Steve. Uh, this, like I said, I was given this about two weeks ago and um, I haven't gone anywhere with it yet. But the reason why I'm bringing it out on this show is um, to kind of fill in some of the blanks that people have had with uh, watching that footage. Because like I said, when you do watch the Melody Maker Awards, most people are assured that that's biological Paul McCartney, and um, as it does state in memoirs as well, it is not biological Paul, but unlike memoirs, this person stepped forward and gave me that person's name. But I can't go anywhere with it yet as far as the name of that person until I can clear it with my source. Yeah, without making it too long-winded, if I could ask you, is that the same uh, double that would have been in the Memphis backstage interview? He has very round head, barely any neck. I don't know if you know which one you know that I'm talking about, but it's... Yeah, I do. This is the one where he has kind of a, like a, a bowling ball head, right? He does. It's very round. And then there, there's somebody else put a video out on that, and then it shows Billy like a year later. Yeah, I go back and forth, Steve, with the Memphis Paul. His face does appear rounder. He's clearly wearing a wig, and he does look smaller in stature when we compare him to the other Beatles during the interview. On the other hand... He has the scar on his upper lip, like Paul did. But then again, as it's explained in memoirs, scars and moles were surgically added to Billy. So who knows? But if I had to guess, the Memphis Paul might very well be another double. I'll add the clip to the show, and uh, maybe I'll put a slide in, and we'll let the audience decide for themselves. Okay. Okay, so this is what was told to me by this particular source. Right out of the shoot. From day one, they had three doubles slash lookalikes for every Beatle. Aside from biological Paul, there were three lookalikes and doubles. So now we have four Pauls. The same for John, the same for George, and the same for Ringo. Interesting. And that's why the images and the photos that people are looking at and trying to examine and picking up on anomalies and all that stuff, and trying to figure out who's who, that's why it is very, very difficult. Because right from day one, boom, there was four of them out there of each Beatle. And this person told me that these doubles and lookalikes were used primarily as decoys yep. going in and out of buildings and so on. And, and of course, um, Billy had doubles as well. In fact, I received a comment on my Paul is Dead channel. Uh, it was either today or yesterday. And, you know, somebody was asking about doubles and Billy. Well, Billy had doubles as well. That's why we see anomalies when we look at his timeline, starting from 1966 through current day. Memoirs tells us that even as of today, Billy still utilizes a double. Interesting. 
Yeah, it is. It is interesting, and that's why it makes it very, very tough to to discern and to decode this thing because you know you really sometimes you don't even know who you're looking at. Yeah. You think you do, and uh, again, like I said, the double they pulled out for the Melody Maker Awards. So that's that's an amazing lookalike. Yeah. I'll put that comparison up, and you can take a look at it, and you'll see. Yeah, they are two different people, but like I said, if you ran into them in the street, or if you were talking to them, yeah, or you weren't analyzing their faces. You would think he was speaking to Paul McCartney. Okay, so let's let's move to uh, I guess the Life magazine cover because there is that spade again. Tell us a little bit about this because there's some things you picked up on. It's got the dog there again. It's the same time period as when they were planting the bulbs. I mean, you could just tell that. And this this actual Life magazine cover was not used. You know, there's another one that's shown with his babies and all that. You know, right? It's that's the one that was used. I was trying to figure out up near his shoulder, Bill's shoulder, if you got that slide up. Yep. I didn't know if that's the top of the standing stone there or not, but it looks like some protrusion there. I don't know what that is, but it seemed odd up there. That's something I didn't even talk to you about before. But you can kind of see the tip of what looks like a rock to me. So maybe this is lower where they planted. You know, it might have been lower than the standing stone for some reason. But I thought it was interesting that the Life magazine logo was put down below as if it was a casket almost like it would be under the ground and every life magazine cover i've ever seen is in the upper right so that was a little bit bizarre to me too and it looks like martha is looking up towards that stone to me too paul and linda are looking somewhere else she's sitting down it looks like the same area you can see actually the bulbs in there if you look really closely it looks like there's white bulbs down below before they rolled the ground back that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so this is what I picked up from it, right? So you tell me what you think. Yeah. We have Billy and Linda looking in the same direction. They're looking ahead. Right. The dog is looking back. Looking behind, yep. Yeah. Right? So Billy looking forward, and then Martha, that's the dog's name, right? Right. Is looking back. And if that is the standing stone, looking back at biological Paul McCartney. Yeah, he's looking right at the stone. And I, I believe that's what it is back there. Right? And I'm only discovering that now as I'm looking at the picture. I didn't even notice that. And that's how it happens with this. You start to notice something else, and wow, you know? Yeah. And life, Yeah. you made the observation that it's down below to the left. But think in terms of the word itself. Life yeah. is buried. Life is underground. Yeah. It's really, really a clue. And, and that, again, you know, I get shivers from this stuff because, you know, I'm looking into this. This is all interconnecting. It's all clues that if you were a cop or something and you were digging into something forensically and you're trying to solve a crime, to me, all this stuff goes together. It's like a puzzle piece. Yeah. Or you look at it, you know, why is that down below there? Life magazine never had it below there. And, you know, why is that spade and these flowers and stuff in John Lennon's drawing? You know, why? <laughs> it, it's all interconnected. It's amazing. Yeah, it, it is amazing, and uh, great job of, of picking up on it, Steve. Yeah, thanks. So then we have uh, the next slide. It's looking through the bent back tulips, and, of course, you've already mentioned to us that it appears that they are planting tulips, possibly. Tulip bulbs, yep. This would potentially explain the line in the song Glass Onion, looking through the bent back tulips. Yep. And we have a photo or an image to the right where we've got all four beetles behind um, a bunch of tulips. That's correct, yeah. And you know what's interesting, too, Steve, is I don't know if this means anything, but I kind of chuckled when I read it. At the bottom of that image, it says, Live in Sweden and the Netherlands. <laughs> yeah, the dates, 63 and 64. So. Yeah, yeah. And that isn't Billy's face in the picture, too. I, I did, Maybe it is biological. Paul. Oh, I couldn't really tell on that picture. Yeah, it's hard sometimes to pick up on it because uh, so many of these images were blended. Yeah, manipulated, yeah. Boy, there are so many out there. Folks, they have been manipulating images since day one. Yeah. Now, in memoirs, it tells us that if you want the true pictures of Paul McCartney, biological Paul, then you have to use the album covers, that uh, doubles and lookalikes were not used when they were doing the photo shoots for, for the album covers. So I guess the best thing to do would be not only to look at the uh, the official album covers itself, but maybe even look at the alternate album cover photos that were taken. Because whenever they do photo shoots, it's not just one photo, right? Right. 
So they take a bunch of them and then they decide which one they're going to go with. So uh, anyway, so yeah, so looking through the bent back tulips. And again, Steve, as you said, little clues here and there, right? So looking through the bent back tulips, that line by itself, a lot of people don't give it any thought. They just think it's kind of, you know, it's, it's the imagery that Lennon used in a lot of his writing of lyrics, or at least that's what we're told, the official story. He liked imagery through lyrics. Yeah. And so we can chalk it up as that, or we could tie it back to what you have shown us, which is planting tulips at what appears to be a grave site near a standing stone on his farm in Scotland. <laughs> yep, you spin it all together. And, you know, if you're looking through the bent back tulips, think think about that if, if Paul is buried under there and if he could actually see as a dead person. You know, looking through the bent back tulips means he's underneath because the tulips will be bending. From that perspective, it's from the bottom. You know, it's not from the top. It's not looking at, you know, it, it just seems like that's what they're trying to say. He's under the bent back tulips. And that's why when I saw those bulbs and everything being planted, I, I just wish we could get a drone up there at some point. I'm hoping the guy comes through for me if eventually. You know, it might not come out in this video, but maybe some the future. I'll be able to see if there's reddish colored tulips or like the color of the tulips in that folk, uh, album cover. It would be interesting because I think that would be what you would find up there. Yeah. So let's go to um, Yellow Submarine. And uh, this is something that, you know, I know of, Yellow Submarine. The movie itself, folks, is loaded up with all kinds of occult symbolism. But I haven't spent uh, too much time on uh, talking about the album cover. So uh, Steve will take us through this because he has looked at it. And uh, there are some interesting clues and uh, points of interest that we should talk about. So where did you want to start, Steve, with uh, the album cover of uh, Yellow Submarine? With Yellow, I thought that maybe there's something to do with the word yellow. I, you know, I looked up, just Google, what does yellow mean in different cultures? It says here, it says on one, one hand, yellow stands for freshness, happiness, positivity, clarity, energy, optimism, enlightenment, remembrance, intellect, honor, loyalty, and joy. But on the other, it represents cowardice and deceit. A dull or dingy yellow may represent caution, sickness, and jealousy. But deceit really stood out to me there, because this whole thing is deceit. It's deceiving the public. We believe, many of us believe, something that isn't true. I thought that was interesting, you know, because I just came up with that today after I Googled it. I wish I came up with it earlier, because it would have been more part of this presentation. You know, and as we know, and you and I talked about this before the show, uh, this this whole thing with the Beatles and uh, really everything that the controllers do is all about duality. So when you just read the uh, the definition or uh, description of of the color yellow, having positive attributes and also negative attributes, that's the duality. Yeah. Right. So uh, and that's what this is all about, folks. We live in duality world. That's how the elite operate. Uh, it's just loaded up with occultism. Okay, so let me just take a look here, Steve. One of the things I think we might want to talk about is the fact that the Beatles on the Yellow Submarine album sure look like they're standing on a hill. It sure does. And, uh, you know, you'd think with a submarine it would show the ocean. And in that drawing, to me, it does not show an ocean at all. To me, it looks like a high hill. And I believe that's representative of the Scottish Farm Hill. I'm actually an artist, too. I do paintings and stuff. As I did it as my job as a graphic artist for a while, but, I mean, I pick up visual stuff very quickly. Yeah. That just stood out to me as that's a hill. It even kind of shows layers. It shows grass, then it shows another layer of dirt. You know, if you look at those colors, they're standing on top of. And then you see to what me, if you were, if you were doing a measurement in feet, to me it looks like that submarine's about six feet down under does to me anyway. Yeah. And then to the right of it, after it says the Beatles Yellow Submarine, to the right of it, it says nothing is real. I always thought this album cover had no clues on it. You know, of all the album covers, I thought this had absolutely nothing on it. So, But the more that I got into this, him being buried on a hill in Scotland, I thought maybe this was really trying to tell me something. So a submarine to me would be... You know, when I think of, like, even getting a submarine sandwich or something, they call them subs. And then that kind of clicked in my mind that a sub 
and means substitute. So Billy being a substitute for Paul, that's what I kind of thought. Whether I'm right on that, I don't know. It's just conjecture, like I said. But I believe that yellow submarine is a symbolism for a casket. You'll see that there's three facing forward on the periscopes, and there's one facing behind. The thing is more loaded with clues than I believe anybody has ever thought of, at least from what I can see. You know, and then, of course, you got John Lennon's symbolism on the top there with his hands. That's the sign of the goat. That's Baphomet. Okay. And it's right over Paul's head, you know. So this is all stuff I never noticed as a kid, and I bought these albums, you know. Like you said, I went to see the movie. Didn't really see clues in the movie. I mean, I think there probably is. Yeah. But I don't know what they are. I, I, I'd have to analyze it more. But I definitely believe that that's showing them on a hill in Scotland, basically. It, it's all symbolism. And, and if Paul's buried six feet down and nothing is real, that's going on. Right. So the sub would be a uh, maybe a casket, right? Yeah, you're you're down under something, you know, in a sub. You know, you're not a, you're not above land. That I thought was a little bit odd. You know, again. A couple of things that I picked up on, Steve, like you mentioned, uh, John Lennon's uh, making the sign of the goat Baphomet over uh, Paul's head. Yeah. Many times we'll see the palm, and the palm, folks, uh, stands for Paul McCartney. Paul M. That's why the palm we see in uh, a number of pictures over Paul's head. We see it on the, the cover of Sgt. Pepper, in fact. And if we look at uh, Fred, old Fred to the left, we see he has see, his hand and his jacket, and that's the, the hidden hand of Freemasonry. Yep, the old Napoleon kind of thing. <laughs> yep, yep. And then if we look to the right, we see one of the characters has the number 23, which is 5. Yeah. So we would think in terms of five Beatles when we add Billy to the equation. So we had biological Paul, John, George, and Ringo, and then Billy. That's five. In fact, in the film, they show the Beatles looking out the portals. We have John, George, and Ringo, and two Pauls. So what I'll do, Steve, as we're talking about this, I do have that, an image of that. So I will put that in the show so people can see that in Yellow Submarine, they're showing us five Beatles. Okay. Okay, so I'll put that in there. But uh, yeah, no, this is some quick call-outs, folks, for Yellow Submarine, and it is filled with symbolism. And I agree with Steve. They are standing on a hill. The submarine itself, like Steve said, we abbreviate submarine as sub, substitution or a substitute for Paul, and also a sub can also infer subterranean or below ground. Right. And then if, if you put that thing, that word, in the color yellow, you put deceit with sub, a deceitful substitute, right? Right. I, I get into this stuff, but, you know, whether it means anything, I don't know. But that's what it stands out to me as being. Yeah, well, I, I could tell you, Steve, that I think it means a lot more than yeah. you might give it credit for or, or some of the folks listening, because one of the things that I've I've noticed in spades – doing this work is that everything is a clue. Everything's encoded. Everything has some esoteric meaning. There's some mysticism. There's some occultism. It's throughout yeah. this entire conspiracy. And, uh, you know, what might seem ridiculous to most people is not ridiculous for those of us that are looking at it and do have an understanding of how these clues are encoded. Yeah. Don't discount anything. Could we be wrong on certain understandings or what we're putting together? Of course. Of course we can be. But what I have found is that, you know, when you start to uh, look at it the way you're looking at it yeah. and the way others, myself, are looking at this thing, that's how we begin to solve the puzzle. Some of these things we might discard and say, okay, well, it didn't lead anywhere. But in other cases, these strange connections that we think we're making actually pan out. Yeah, I believe you're there. And I, I've noticed that in that drawing, you know, it shows Paul directly above that submarine, too. Yep. Above the periscope. He's kind of dead center to that. And he's the same size as Ringo. Now, it looks like Paul's the smallest guy there with Ringo, you know. <laughs> so, kind of odd. And Paul was a small guy. Yeah, no, he wasn't a tall guy. In fact, um, you know, the way they made him look taller was it was, you know, trickery used with the way they took the pictures and uh, the way they positioned the camera. I mean, they had techniques that were in play to keep the deception. Yeah. Alive and well. Speaking of deception, I, I think this is our last slide. It's been a fabulous discussion, a lot of fun. 
These are two images, and uh, even though it doesn't have anything to do with where biological Paul is buried, they're still very interesting images. So tell us what's going on here. Showing biological Paul on the left, who we call Billy on the right, who other people think is Paul McCartney. But, you know, it just doesn't match up. You can see his eyes higher, you know, the ear level like you put on there. there there's a lot that's different, the way the eyebrows go. Yeah, just the shape of the face. Billy has an elongated face, whereas Paul had a rounder face. Yeah, Billy's a huge guy. He's much bigger than biological Paul ever was, you know. Yeah. And then, of course, we all know about Stan Shaw, if you're steeped in this. If you're just tuning in, you probably wouldn't understand this. And I've, I've had a lot of arguments with people that don't believe that Bill is Stanshaw. I mean, Stanshaw from the Doo Dog, whatever it's called, band. The Bonzo Dog Band, yeah. Okay. And, of course, Phil Ackrell, back from uh, Denny Lane and all that. I'm sure they've seen your video comparisons and stuff. I, I really enjoyed that. It helped me a lot with it. But I actually put this one together myself because I, I saw, like, a morphine picture of Stanshaw turning into Billy on the Internet. But I never saw anybody do a side-by-side -side comparison. And I'll tell you, I just flipped out when I put these together. Like I said, I'm a graphic artist. I know about spatiality, you know, if you're doing a portrait or something about proportions. Proportions to Stanshaw to Billy are incredibly perfect. They, they just match up exactly perfect. And I know you found somebody sent you something, too, which maybe you could put in there at some point. But, you know, there's another one where he has a beard, and that matches up perfect. Right. Stanshaw had more of a hooded eyelid and, and that lazy eye kind of a little bit. He had what I believe was just surgery on his eyelid at that point, you know, to look more like Bill does now, to look more like Paul. And they, they actually did. I, I Googled about if the – I can't remember the exact term for that surgery is, but it, it fixes a hooded eyelid. It makes it so it won't be like that. And if you look at those images, I mean, it's darn close. And if he just dyed his hair, dyed his eyebrows, the whole bit, mustache, beard, whatever, he, he's right on there. It looks already like him, you know? So, and I don't know what age that was for Stanshaw in that picture. You might know better, you know, what, what time period that was. Yeah, I would say that's probably around 1967 or so. It is interesting, though, that there are people that don't see the fact that he played Stanshaw from the Bonzo Dog Band with Neil Innes. It's uh, it's it's amazing to me. It's it's very clear that he did. Yeah. And uh, there are people that believe that Vivian Stanshaw was a real person, and he wasn't a real person. He was a character that was invented by Billy. And then when Billy's McCartney role got hot and heavy, and he had to spend more time doing that, that's when he hired Victor, Street Viv, to play the Stanshaw role, so that McCartney and Stanshaw can can exist in parallel. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, there's, there's no question that he played um, Vivian Stanshaw from the Bonzo Dog Band and uh, that there were two Stanshaws. There was uh, Victor, Street Viv, and uh, Billy's version. And to the best of my knowledge, Victor or Street Viv never played with the Bonzos. That's how we can delineate the two. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know, Steve. It, people either see it or they don't. That, that's how I look at it. There's a lot of people that just don't want to, uh, they don't want to see it. And so they just shut down. They just don't want to believe that, I guess, maybe the level of deception is that deep. Correct. That not only were they bamboozled with the fact that uh, he took on the Paul McCartney role, but that he also played other characters. Yeah. And he did play a version of Phil Ackrell with the Diplomats when he played with uh, Denny Lane and Bev Bevan, who went on to ELO fame, the drummer. Yeah. You know, and what happened, folks, with the uh, the whole Diplomats piece of it was that uh, Billy was the original Phil Ackrell in the band, and then he leased the role to Phil Ralston. Okay, and, and Ralston was hoping that he could take the role further and make some money at it and all that stuff, but uh, it, it just didn't pan out. The Diplomats... Uh, Although Billy tells us in memoirs they did make an album, it's it's unreleased, it's locked up in some vault somewhere, and uh, maybe someday it'll see the light of day, maybe, I don't know. So that's how the whole Phil Ackrell piece worked. There were two Ackrells. <laughs> yeah. It was Billy's version, and it was Phil Ralston who uh, who picked it up after Billy moved on from it. 
And there were two Stanshaws. There was the one that Billy played and the one that Victor played, who was uh, Street Fifth. So uh, I don't know. And and the other thing, Steve, and I know you know this as well, because you and I have talked about this on the uh, Paul is Dead pages that we're on and stuff like that. But uh, all we need to do is look at James McCartney, uh, Billy's son. Yeah, that's totally amazing there. I mean, it's a spinning image for yeah. uh, Vivian Stanshaw. How did that happen? No. Yeah. <laughs> right? So so people will look at that, and, you know, I've shown people, and they say, yeah, well, yeah, woo, that looks a, yeah, it looks a lot like yeah. him. But, yeah, I still don't believe it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, you're just in denial. You're in denial yeah. if you're taking that position. If you can see it, yeah. but then you don't want to see it, that's denial. Right. And then, of course, you know, uh, Denny Lane, in both bands, you know, the Diplomats and then in Wings. It's interesting when you listen to Denny Lane, who's, whose real name, by the way, folks, is Brian Hines. <laughs> okay. A lot of folks don't know that either. Denny Lane is Brian's stage name. But uh, it was an interview going back uh, a few years ago. He never mentions Paul McCartney by name. No. Right? He says that he played with uh, Billy Shears. But in that interview, Denny never says, what are you talking about? I played with Paul McCartney. He never says that. And then uh, my friend Walt Schnabel uh, met Denny backstage. Uh, Denny played in his hometown. So Walt volunteers at this venue and uh, periodically or occasionally. And uh, Walt had written me before Denny played there. And he says, hey, Mike, you know, Denny's coming here to play with his band. And, you know, a lot of times I get to meet the uh, the artists backstage. And he says, if I do, he says, I'm going to ask him about Billy. Yeah. And uh, so I said, oh, that'd be great, you know. So long story short, folks, and I'll put the link down to that that interview I did with Walt in the show notes below. He did ask Denny about playing with uh, Billy Shepard. Yeah. And uh, and Denny said, who? And then Walt said, oh, come on, Denny. You know what I'm, what I'm talking about. And he goes, oh, you mean Billy McCartney? Yeah. So we have another situation where Denny doesn't say Paul McCartney. No. You know, he calls him everything other than Paul McCartney. He's got, you know, uh, Billy Shears, Billy McCartney. It's just, yeah. it gets to be funny after a while. Yeah, George Harrison's wife saying, hello, Billy. So. Yeah. <laughs> that was at the concert for George. Yep. Yep. I'm also on a Vivian uh, Stanshall site on Facebook. Yeah. Am I allowed to mention Key Longfellow? I guess it was his girlfriend. Can I say that on here? I could always cut it out if I can't. But yeah, Kai Longfellow. Kai yeah. Longfellow. I didn't, yeah. So anyway, she's on Messenger. I tried to write to her because... She posted a bunch of different pictures, and it shows her with the Vivian Stanshaw, which is actually Billy. And then it shows her with the old, you know, the, the other guy that took his place. Victor. One you call Street Vid. Yeah. Yeah. So it shows her with both, and I, I just happened to, to write her a message. I really didn't expect her to answer me. And, of course, she didn't. She kept silent. But I, I wrote her and wanted to know, you know, why she was with both, you know, why with, with Vivian Stanshaw the young version and the old version. I, so even then they were trying to like hide stuff that way too. It was really bizarre. So, but she didn't answer me. I, I kind of hoped she would, but she is on messenger and uh, she probably gets asked stuff like that a lot. And just finds it annoying or can't say anything. Yeah. Add that in. So, but if you need to cut it, I understand. No, 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 no. Actually it's, it's good to talk about this a little bit. So, you know, I released my, uh, my video going back, I guess, about a year and a half ago, two years ago. I, I lose track of time sometimes with this stuff. But it had to do with uh, analyzing McCartney, Stanshall, and Ackrell. And in, in that presentation, I had shown that there were indeed two Vivian Stanshalls. Yeah. It was Billy's version, as you mentioned before, Steve, who played with the Bonzo Dog Band with Neil Innes. And there was Victor, who I refer to as Street Viv, who was married to Kai. Mm -hmm. And uh, when... That presentation was released. I was told by somebody who was on that page, things got really quiet for about a week. And uh, and then after about a week, you know, some people were all up in arms and they were very angry and upset with me for putting that video out. And I was crazy and all that stuff. But uh, from what I understand, not a whole lot from Kai. So when I do this work, in particular, when I was doing the Stanshall piece, I'm never looking to to hurt anybody. Right. I'm just taking a look at what's out there, and if somebody is a public persona and they're making records and they're making movies and all that stuff, it's fair game, especially when you come across evidence that uh, there were different people playing the part. 
And so, you know, so my my response to folks who get upset with me when I had put that presentation out about Stanchol and Acryl and, and all that is don't get mad at me because that information was revealed in Billy's book. It was, yeah. That's why that's why I kind of asked her, hoping I'd get some little answer, but she's just not allowed to say anything, I guess. You know? Yeah, the information was put out by Billy himself. Billy is the one who spilled the beans and let the cat out of the bag. Right. Not Mike. Mike just read the book and then said, let me see if I can substantiate this. Is this true? Right. That's all I did. And so when I went about my work, I confirmed, I believe, validated the fact that Billy did play a version of Stanshall and that there was another person playing the character that Billy hired who was on Billy's payroll in order to, like I said before, to allow the McCarty and the Stanshall character to run in parallel. Yep. So, uh, again, so I just want to put that out there because uh, I am sensitive to the fact that Kai was married to um, to Victor, and that was her husband. And, um, you know, he built a career around the Stanshall character. So I don't want to get in the way of that. That's why, to be honest with you, Steve, when I put the presentation out, I just put it out. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't banging a lot of drums about it. Yeah, yeah. If I really wanted to push it, I could have continued to really market it and all that stuff, and I didn't. I put it out there. I kind of slipped it in under the covers, if you will, so that it wouldn't make a big splash because I am sensitive to the fact that, you know, that was her husband and, and she's still here and they've got children and everything else. So, like I said, I didn't want to uh, make too much of a splash with it. Right. But that being said, again, I'll go back to this. I know I'm repeating myself. If there's a bone to pick, that has to go back to Billy. Yeah, no doubt. I didn't write the book. Yeah. You know? So. Yeah, even even in this video, I, I'm meeting, like, Billy or, or anybody any harm. I, I just, it's hunches I have. So hopefully nothing's taken the wrong way. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be taken the wrong way at all, uh, Steve, because if they didn't want the information out at this time, yeah. memoirs would have been published that's, you know, plain and simple. And as we mentioned before we started the show, yeah. nothing could have been more controversial than me coming out and saying that the Beatles didn't write their music between 1962 and 1966. Right. Well, they wrote very, very little of it. Yeah, you proved it. Thank you. I like to think that I, I did prove it. So, I mean, that is about as controversial as you can get. And again, if Billy's going to show us images of his standing stone on his farm, and he's going to have an album called Standing Stone, and he's going to write a song with Elvis Costello called Shallow Grave. Right. And he's going to put an album out called Flowers in the Dirt. <laughs> yeah. Sooner or later, somebody or groups of people are going to pick up on this and start to follow the breadcrumbs, which is what you did. And you did an excellent job. So thank you. I mean, I know we're, we're about wrapped up here, but I just want to say that I think the work that you've done here is great. It's exceptional. And I do believe there is an extremely high probability, possibility, that that standing stone on his farm is where biological Paul McCartney is buried. It's possible. That's what I think. I've had other people write me and say, oh, he's buried here, he's buried there, but they have no proof of it. They're not showing any evidence. They're not connecting any dots. They're just blurting things out. And I always go back to these folks. I said, look, it's not good enough to say, oh, he's buried here. Yeah. How do you know he's buried there? It always goes dark, Steve. There's never a response or they come back with some, just a bunch of gibberish. And I'm not into gibberish. You've got to give me evidence, facts, circumstantial evidence, connect dots, put logic and reason behind it. Just don't parrot or reiterate whatever it is you may have read or heard someplace else. That doesn't work. But in this case with you, you've connected a lot of dots, in my opinion. All right. That's great. Thanks. And I'm very honored to be on your show, too, by the way. Just, uh, you know, the stuff you've done is mind-blowing. It's great. So I feel really honored to be on the show. I really do. Well, Steve, it's my honor to have you on because – you have done an excellent job with this and in other aspects of the conspiracy that you have looked at. When I told folks, when I did the big presentation, did the Beatles write all their own music, I did a lot of research. Obviously, you know, I, I did a lot of heavy lifting, but there was a network of researchers that I was connected into 
that were also extremely good at this. And they had uncovered some very and very important aspects of the conspiracy. So it's people like yourself and uh, a lot of other folks that I'm connected into and uh, that I associate with that have done fabulous work and have fabulous insights, you know. So it's not just a one-man show. It's kind of like us all talking and getting together, like doing a show like this and trying to bring more pieces of it together so that it starts to make more sense or, God forbid, we actually solve the mystery. Team of detectives, basically. <laughs> right. Right, exactly. Yep. All right, Steve, thank you so much for coming on. Pleasure. Thank you.